Welcome to the second class for Biotech 201. I know I'm not Dr. Neil Lamb. I'm um, Elizabeth Heron, and I'm the Director of, uh, of External Relations for the Hudson Alpha Foundation. And before we get started tonight, I have just a couple of quick announcements. So if you'll direct your attention to the screen behind me, and I think you have one of these in your packet as well, um, we want you to know about a new event that Hudson Alpha is hosting on Thursday, February 27th at 4.30 p.m. It's going to be here in the Jackson Center. And we will have a distinguished panel of women who are leaders in the science, technology, engineering, and math fields. In this panel discussion, these women will share who and what inspired them to enter their respective STEM fields and how they came, overcame adversity to be successful in their fields. This is a really distinguished list. Now I'll give you a second to look at it. Um, you'll notice names like Jody Singer, who is the director of Marshall Space Flight Center, and Jane Grimwood, who is our very own Hudson Alpha faculty investigator um, that helped sequence the first human genome with Dr. Rick Myers at Stanford University. So this is going to be a really outstanding event with some fabulous leaders in our community. Um, students are welcome to attend this event. We hope that you will join us if you can, and if all you need to do is register, just so we know that you're coming. Um, and you can register at hudsonalpha.org slash women in STEM. OK? Question. Question, sir. Are you going to broadcast that? We are not going to broadcast. We are not going to, the question was, are we going to broadcast, like, like do a simulcast? And we're not going to do that. You have to be here in person to see it. Are you going to have it recorded so somebody can? We're talking about recording it. Yes. Come here since she was 12. She's been up on your interns. And now she's down at Mississippi State taking biochemistry. Okay. Yeah. It'd be very good for her to be able to see that. Okay, well, you've convinced me. <laughs> that Done. We, we talked about that today. Do we want to try to record it? Yes. So um, everybody's nodding their heads yes. Okay, so we will. We will record it and we'll put it on our website sometime after that, but it probably won't be live that night. Okay. Okay, okay, good. Okay, announcement number two. Um, so I want to know who is enjoying Biotech 201? Oh, yes, awesome. Okay. How many people have enjoyed other Biotech 101 or 201 programs? Everybody in here, all right, obviously. So that's great news and not a surprise. Um, we want you to know that these wonderful programs, we love doing them every year. Dr. Lamb does them, his team helps do them. And we love doing them at no cost to you all. As a matter of fact, many of the educational programs that Hudson Alpha offers to students and teachers and the public are free for people to attend. As a nonprofit organization, this is only made possible, you know what I'm gonna say, through your generous donations. <laughs> So if you have ever supported a Hudson Alpha education program, raise your hand. Thank you very much. You all rock. We appreciate everything that you have done. Thank you. Would you please consider making a donation tonight so that we can continue to offer these programs to students and teachers and lifelong learners of all ages? There are several ways you can make a gift, and please know that donations of any size are appreciated and truly do make a difference. Oh, there, I did it this time. Okay, you can text the word education to 21000, that's 21,000 on your mobile device. This will take you to a secure link where you can complete your donation. I think there are also envelopes in your packet, and you can use those. You can make a gift tonight, or of course you can mail it in later if you'd like. Thank you for considering this. I promise you every penny that you give us is used very wisely by the Educational Outreach Team. On behalf of Dr. Lamb, the whole Educational Outreach Team and the Foundation, we thank you. So now, you don't want to hear from me anymore. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Neil Lamb.
Welcome to a very special Biotech 201. <laughs> it is not every day that this happens. I promise, it is not every day that this happens. But, um, so we are in for a fun night tonight. Hopefully everybody's got their cookies. Hopefully uh, you've got your coffee or your water. And we are now gonna continue our study on the biomolecules of life. So last week we talked about lipids. Tonight we're gonna talk about proteins. So let me first, um, Elizabeth, thank you very much. Um, I'm really excited about the Women in STEM event. We have some phenomenal women in our community that have really broken a lot of glass ceilings. Uh, and Huntsville is an incredible place to see that happen. It has not happened enough in other parts of our state and in other parts of our country. And we hope to be able to showcase what can happen in a community like this and inspire countless uh, young women to think about opportunities that are available to them. Let me also say a word of thank you to the Ashburn Foundation, our presenting sponsor, and for our in-kind sponsors, the Jackson Center, Orange Beard Productions, and Fantasy Playhouse, without whom this phenomenal experience <laughs> would not have been made possible. This does not just hang out in my closet, I promise, <laughs> I promise. So, with that, let's go on ahead and get started. And before we talk about proteins, Let's take our historical voyage. So, it is the early 1600s, and the epicenter of Europe, both militarily and economically, is Spain. In a similar way, the center of fashion is not housed in Paris, but in Madrid. Fashion at this point in time, driven by what's happening in Spain, can be described in three words, tight, rigid and black. <laughs> Spanish fashion dictated what people wore all over Europe and it was primarily black. And this is the reason why. It was very difficult to get a deep dark black dye. It required multiple rounds of dyeing and it was very expensive. So if you wore black, it was a symbol that you had power and that you had money because you could afford it. But black was also incredibly boring. <laughs> so, in 1643, Louis XIV ascended the throne of France and set out to change that, to change the epicenter of Europe to France and to change French fashions along with it. And he did it in spectacular ways over a 70 plus year reign. He completely remade what France looked like and the way France was thought of in the eyes of Europe. Much of that, actually the credit for that, goes to Louis' finance minister, Jean-Baptiste Colbert, who is wearing black and not nearly as resplendent as Louis in this picture. But Jean-Baptiste Colbert instituted a policy that essentially said, France first. Anything that can be made in France will be made in France and we will forbid anyone from importing it in from anywhere else. So he essentially created enormous industries that hadn't existed in France. Textile, furniture, jewelry, silver making, fabric embroidery and weaving. And put the people of France to work and set France at the center of European life. So French fashion was built by France, for France, and included incredibly brilliant colored dyes and embroidered fabrics. The concept that you see, this is the beginning of the Baroque or the Rococo period around the time of Louis. One of perhaps the most important decisions that was made around fashion was that Louis decreed that new fashions were going to be required to come out twice a year, in the winter and in the summer, and that all of the courts and all of the nobles would buy the new fashions in winter and in summer. 
This is still evident in the fashion seasons that we have today, and it was instituted by Louis XIV. Not only did this mean that there was a constant stream of people buying these clothes, driving the industry, driving the economy forward, but the French were notoriously fickle and bored easily with fashion, and so every six months there was a completely new style for them to experience. At the heart of French fashion was a love of silk. And silk is a big part of the story that we're going to tell tonight. So, silk has been made in China for probably close to 6,000 years. Silk has been produced, cultivated, shaped in China 6,000 years. And for at least 2,000 years, the Chinese have traded those silk goods with the rest of the world along a set of paths that you and I know as the Silk Road. The Silk Road starts in a city in China, Xi'an, and from there, traders would carry silk goods either north or south, around the desert, through the mountains, and to the city of Antioch. This journey took about a year to go from the originating city to Antioch. And then in Antioch, it would spread up the north and south coast of the Mediterranean. Now the concept of Silk Road often makes us think that one group of people traveled this entire route the entire time, but that wasn't the way it worked. There were bands of individuals that would travel between trading posts, between oasis cities, and then they would barter with other groups that would then carry it the next step. So there were groups of individuals, groups that carried this from place to place. Now, in spite of the fact that silks were well known and in demand throughout Europe and Asia, China managed to keep the monopoly on the growing of the silkworm, the creating of the silk threads, the production of the silk fabric for hundreds and hundreds of years. In part because of an imperial decree that said anyone caught exporting silkworm or silkworm eggs would be put to death. It's a pretty effective way to keep your trade secrets within your country. But in the first and third century AD, silk secrets somehow found their way both to Japan and to India. In about 522 AD, the Western world learned the secrets of silk as well. The emperor of the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, Justinian, actually entered into an agreement with a group of monks from the Nestorian church. And over a two-year window, this group of monks traveled to China, brought back on their first trip mulberry plant seeds. Mulberry leaves are what the silkworms eat. And on the second visit, brought back silkworm eggs and silkworm caterpillars in a hollowed out cane that they carried. Now that's what the legend says, and if it's true, it was probably one of the first cases of industrial espionage um, that we've got in recorded history. So Constantinople became a huge epicenter of silk production, silk fabric making, silk weaving, until about the 1200s when the Crusades in Europe caused huge turmoil in the Muslim um, Byzantine Empire. The sack of Constantinople in about 1203 caused enormous numbers of silk weavers and silk um, producers to flee. 2,000 of them went to Europe. And so now, silk production is now available in Italy. And so Italy becomes, during the Renaissance, kind of the premier, prem the premier maker of rich brocades and rich fabrics. In about the early 1600s, um, France begins to step into this game as well in the city of Lyon. They're given specific permission by the king at that point in time, I think that's Louis IX, to begin building uh, a silk epicenter. Um, the silkworms are cultivated in the fields around Lyon in Provence. And by the time of Louis XIV, there are 14,000 silk looms in the city of Lyon. So at this point, 1685, France is 
pretty much at the heart of fashion. The French silks are better than any silks anywhere else. They're lightweight, they're beautifully embroidered, they sparkle, they shine. Louis is at the top of his game, both in the fashion world. I don't know if you noticed it, but Louis, that picture of Louis had these phenomenal red heels. Louis always wore red heels. And it was a sign of favor if Louis allowed any of his courtiers to wear red heels as well. And let me tell you, after standing in these teeny tiny heels for only like 20 minutes, I do not know how Louis did it. I do not know how you ladies who wear heels do it as well. But, so that now brings us, 1685. Louis is Catholic. And if you go back to your history, in this time frame, we have the Protestant Reformation that has happened within the previous 100, 150 so years. And you now have Protestants and you have Catholics all over Europe. Some countries have become Protestant-centered countries. Some have stayed, like Spain, very, very Catholic. And some places you've got mixes of Protestant and Catholic, like in England and in France, and they're trying to figure that out. In France, at the beginning of the 1600s, the then king, not Louis XIV, issues an edict, the Edict of Nantes, that essentially says, we're going to live together. We're going to allow Protestants, which were called Huguenots, we're going to allow them to have their own church. They can have their own schools. They can worship their own way. France will be a Catholic country, but we are not going to exclude Protestants. Louis, who believes that all things revolve around him, is offended that everyone in his country does not worship the way he believes they should all worship. He takes this quite personally. And he begins a series of campaigns, first to offer economic incentives to induce the Protestants to become Catholic. And then when that doesn't happen, he begins applying pressure to force them to become Catholic. And in 1685, he issues the Edict of Fontainebleau. And the Edict of Fontainebleau essentially revokes the Edict of Nantes and says, all you Protestants, game's over. You either convert to Catholicism or get out. End of the story. And for any Protestants that didn't choose to convert, Louis instituted a policy where he forced the Protestant families to house soldiers in their home and to feed them. And these soldiers were given implicit instructions to behave badly, to be bad house guests, to wreck things, to intimidate the Protestants to force them either to convert, which is what you see in this cartoon in the early, in 1686, you've got the soldier, the dragoon in green, who at gunpoint is forcing the Protestant in red to sign a letter of conversion to Catholicism. So what ultimately ended up happening is most of the Huguenots, most of the Protestants actually left the country. And Louis actually boasted that in less than two years, he had run the population of Protestants from 80,000 down to less than 1,000. And he thought that this was fantastic. He was really very proud of this. But this was an economic disaster for Louis because the Huguenots, the Protestants, were incredibly skilled craftsmen and craftswomen. They were weavers, they were silver makers, they were jewelers, they were clock makers, they were optometrists, and when they left, they took their trade with them. And where did they go? Generally to the Netherlands or to England, the two countries that were sworn enemies of France. And they were all too happy to welcome these Protestants who would actually benefit their economy. So, around the region of London, many of these French silk weavers set up shop. And London soon became known for producing phenomenally elegant silks that actually surpassed the silks that were now being produced by whoever was left in France. So the challenge to the story is um, in an attempt to create the ideal culture and community, Louis shot himself in the foot. And it's likely that in his later years, many of his citizens and many of the members of his court were probably buying their silks from England, not from France. Okay, so there's our history piece, 1685. Let's now talk about silk a little bit. And if you're wondering how this ties to protein, I promise we will make that connection. 
Silk, the silk thread, is a protein. It is the strongest naturally made fiber that we know of, an individual long protein. It's produced by the silkworm moth. These silkworm moths are multiple different kinds of moths. This is the primary, primary cultivated silkworm moth. Its larval form, the larval caterpillar, um, eats only mulberry leaves. And it eats mulberry leaves, it eats many times its weight in mulberry leaves over a 30-day window. And it continually sheds its skin. And at about the end of those 30 days, the caterpillar crawls into a corner or into a space and begins to secrete a drool. Well, you know, lovely, lovely phrase, the caterpillar drools. It secretes a sticky substance that solidifies and hardens in the air and forms a thread-like fiber. That's the silk protein. And over the course of several days, the caterpillar will wrap itself, it will continually move its head in a figure eight motion and wrap this protein around itself, forming this cocoon. And then ultimately, inside the caterpillar, the chrysalis now forms, um, forms a moth, breaks out and goes free, and then the, cycles, the cycle starts again. Unless you are actually using these for silk, in which case the goal is not to have the moth break free because that fractures and fragments the, uh, the strands of the cocoon. Okay, so right here and right now, let's say, let me acknowledge, we are gonna be talking about natural and synthetic fibers and we probably have a whole range of viewpoints in this room about natural fibers and the animals that those natural fibers come from and synthetic fibers and the challenges of where those fibers come from and the cost versus uh, harm to the environment. My goal is not to try to cover every single part of every single issue. Um, my goal also is not necessarily to advocate for one or the other, but to point out some of the pros and some of the challenges with those. But if you are in the room thinking, yeah, but we kill all those caterpillars in order to get the cocoon, yes, you are absolutely right. And that is a challenge. That is one of the reasons why some people do not like silk, because it destroys life. And they believe that all life is sacred. So I just want to acknowledge that right up front. We'll talk about each of these pieces as we go. But an individual cocoon can have up to, hear this, up to 3,000 yards of silk in a single thread. A single thread of silk. Incredible, absolutely incredible. This is a hand-painted um, scroll. It's actually on silk from about 1,200 in China. It's absolutely beautiful. We're going to pull, I'm going to show you a couple of images, but this scroll details the process of silk, uh, silk cultivation, of, of worm, silkworm cultivation and silk manufacturing. And what amazes me is that many of these same pieces are exactly what are often done around the world, even today, now 900, 800 years later. So let's start with this panel right here. So here we've got women that are actually placing silkworm eggs on these round trays and then stacking them. And they're preparing for the eggs to hatch and for the silkworms to be born. Okay, in our next panel, we've got a group of individuals. These are all mulberry leaves and they are actually taking the mulberry leaves, putting them in the trays, or they're, in some cases, moving the silkworms onto the mulberry leaves. And they'll do this multiple times. The worms will eat the mulberry leaves, and then they'll put them on a new tray with brand new mulberry leaves. And they'll do this over the course of an entire month. Oh, you know what? Let me take a step back. Here, these individuals are actually are preparing the frames that the, mold, that the silkworms will spin their cocoons on. So they move them off of the trays of mulberry and they put them on these cocoon, these frames that have lots of little spaces in them and then the silkworms find a space and they spin the cocoon. And then in this panel, people are actually taking the frames and they're pulling the cocoons off the frames and they're putting them in baskets. 
And then this gentleman right here is actually weighing the baskets of cocoons. All right, now we're gonna move up here. Again, more weighing of the baskets of cocoons. And then here's a child and three adults that are actually sorting the cocoons by size. And then this gentleman is sitting on a bench. This individual is tending a fire. This is boiling water. And the cocoons are immersed in the boiling water, which does two things. It kills the animal inside, and then it begins to ungum the stickiness around the cocoon. And so then what the individual does who's sitting on the bench reaches in, grabs, you know, maybe with his with hands, maybe with a utensil, kind of circles around a set of cocoons and pulls up a set of individual strings that have unraveled from the cocoons. Feeds that through a small hole. And then you can see here's a frame. This frame spins, and as it spins, it unwinds the cocoons and pulls the thread into skeins of thread on this big frame. It's the same process that's done in many places today. And then if we come over here, this individual is taking that frame with yarn on it and winding it and then putting it onto bobbins, onto, onto um, spindle spools, and those spools are then loaded onto a loom and the silk threads are woven into silk fiber and into silk fabric. So that's the process. This beautiful, beautiful scroll from about 1200 um, from, uh, from this individual right here that is now at the Cleveland Museum of Art. You can view it online, you can zoom into it. It's just, it, it's really lovely. It's just exquisite. I would encourage you to take a look at it. So that's the process of how we go from cocoon to silk fabric. Silk, as I said, is the strongest natural fiber. It has an incredibly smooth feel. If you touch a piece of silk, it's almost, it's almost fluid in the way that it, that it moves. It takes dye incredibly well. You can dye silk in the most beautiful, vibrant colors. You can print on it. You can do color block on it. You can embroider it. Silk's very smooth, and silk captures the light. It has a shine, but it also has a sparkle. Silk, the silk thread, is a protein. So this leads right into our conversation about proteins as one of the key biomolecules. And we've managed to go a whole set of slides without showing any chemistry, right? <laughs> I haven't shown you a single carbon-hydrogen bond until now. So here we are. So proteins are built from something called amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks that make proteins. And here's the basic chemical structure of our amino acids. So you can see, remember, C's are carbons, H's are hydrogens, O's are oxygens, We've got a new um, element here, N, that's an atom of nitrogen. And then I've got this R, and this R isn't standing for an individual thing, it's a variable for something larger, which we'll come to in just a second. So amino acids have an amino group, that's a nitrogen with hydrogens. Ammonia has a nitrogen with hydrogens on it, amino ammonia. And then it has this characteristic group that we saw last week in our fatty acids conversation, this C double bond OOH. It was at the end of our fatty acids. It happens to be at the end of our amino acid. And you might see it at the end of our nucleic acid in week four. So some common themes that you'll see there. And then we've got this R group. This is sometimes called the, the side chain. This is what varies from amino acid to amino acid. So every amino acid has the same amino group and organic acid group, but each one has a completely different side chain. And here I'm showing you the 20 amino acids, and in blue in each of these cases are the, is the amino in the organic group. And then up above, I'm showing you the different chemical structure 
for the side chains. Now again, just like last week, I am not expecting you to memorize this. I just want you to recognize that there's a whole variety of sizes and shapes. From something really simple that just has a hydrogen for glycine, to something much more complex that has lots of other structures around it. So here is our model. Here's our amino acid. This is also of glycine. This is really simple and straightforward, just to give you a sense of orientation and shape. So the blue is the nitrogen, and you can see I've got two hydrogens attached to it. The dark gray, those are my carbons. I've got two of those carbons. And then the reds are my oxygens. So on this side over here, this is my C double bond OOH. That's my acidic group. And then here in blue, this is my amino group, my nitrogen and my two hydrogens. And in this case, right there, right there, <laughs> is the single hydrogen of my R group. So right here is where all the other pieces come in. I'm just showing you a super simple one, a really small, this is glycine. Glycine's gonna be important when we circle back to silk because it is so small and so simple and so straightforward. All right, I should also note that all around the room here, we've got a set of coat racks that have lots of different scarves and pieces of fabric on them. Some of those are silk, some of those are wool, some of those are synthetic, some of those are blends. And for those of you that are watching at home, this is a great time if you wanna to go to the closet and grab different fabrics that you may got, or after we're finished, if you wanna look at fabrics as well, we'll just talk about different kinds of natural fibers and synthetic fibers, and we'll compare what they're made from. Okay, so proteins are made up of amino acids. Those are the building blocks. Everybody with me on that? Okay. Proteins are also polymers. That means they are made of multiple repeating units, multiple amino acids that are joined together. So a polymer is something that is made from many of a similar copy, all connected together. We're gonna see polymers this week with proteins, next week when we talk about carbohydrates, and the week after when we talk about nucleic acids. So that's a theme that I want you to think about. So I'm showing you three different amino acids, and I haven't specified what the R groups are, I just called them R1, R2, and R3. And I've linked them together, and just like last week when we talked about how our fatty acids join our glycerol to form a triglyceride, you might see an OH and an H. And you remember last week and this week, we pull that out, we pull a water molecule out and we bind, we bond these different amino acids together. And so the linkage is called a peptide bond. And so proteins are sometimes called polypeptides. The individual amino acids are sometimes called peptides. So that's how we actually link these together. Proteins can have hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of amino acids all joined together. And then here's our other key piece, and this is gonna be really important for everything that we talk about with proteins. So I wanna make sure that we take some time and then I'll stop and take some questions. Shape becomes really key. The function of a protein, this is a really hot outfit. Let me just pause there. <laughs> And there was no air conditioning in France in 1685. Um, the shape, the function of a protein is dictated by its shape. So the shape that it assumes allows it to carry out the function that it needs to carry out. And the shape that it assumes is driven by a level of organization that starts with what are the amino acids that make it up? Alanine, glycine, serine, valine, proline. That's the string of amino acids that make up the protein. That's the primary level, the primary structure. But then there's another level where there's interaction between the backbone, the amine and the acid group of each individual amino acid. Remember we talked about hydrogen bonds last week? Those are the bonds between hydrogens and oxygens that held our water molecules together we see the same kind of hydrogen bonding that gives our proteins specific shapes. We'll talk about pleated sheets, and we'll talk about alpha helices tonight. 
And then there's a whole nother set of structures that occur, these structures occur based on what those R groups are, what those pieces that stick up on the ends and how they interact with each other. And then sometimes you've got another level of organization where you have multiple proteins that come together to carry out one function. Hemoglobin that carries oxygen inside your red blood cells is actually made up of four different proteins that all join together in this fourth layer, this quaternary structure. So it's not just the string of amino acids, it's the shape into which they fold. And that becomes really important when we talk about the function of what proteins do. So in our cells, I'm going to step away from silk. Someone just turned the air on. Thank you so very much. Because <laughs> there is a great shirt on underneath here, and you might see it before the night is over when we take all the rest of this stuff off. Um, before we, I'm going to step away from, from silk a second, and I'm going to talk about proteins inside our cells. At this moment, as you sit in your chair, as you watch us online, there are tens of thousands of different proteins in every single one of your cell carrying out their daily functions. It is like the most amazing little city inside your cells that you can imagine. There are proteins that are bringing in nutrients. There are proteins that are breaking those nutrients down into energy for your cells. There are proteins that are defending your cells against foreign invaders. There are proteins that are storing nutrients for later use. Proteins that are communicating with other cells. Proteins that are getting rid of waste. If you could take your cell and dry it down and measure the contents of a cell, more than 50% of the dry mass of your cell would be proteins. Proteins are critical to life. We would just be, I don't know what we would be without proteins. We certainly wouldn't be here having this conversation. But they are instrumental in everything that a cell does. And I know I'm talking about silk and I'm gonna talk about linen, but I want to make sure that we talk about the unbelievable diversity of proteins inside cells. Your cells, my cells, animal cells, plant cells. There are a whole set of different functions that these proteins do, like making, you know, moving energy or transporting things or defending the cell. And each of those proteins does its job because of the shape that it assumes, because of the, the ability, the structure that it, that, it, um, that it comes to the table with. All right, so let me stop and let's take some questions. Because I know we've just covered a lot of ground. Yes, sir. Where does a spider web compare to silk? Ooh, where does a spider web compare to silk? So spider, pro the proteins that make up spider web silk have a whole lot of similarities, a lot of commonality with silkworm silk. At their heart, they contain many of the same key components. Um, they are assembled in a slightly different way. They are produced in a slightly different part of the, of the insect's body versus around the salivary glands of the silkworm, but lots and lots of similarities. Great question. Others? Yes, ma'am. Is the silkworm's thread sticky like the spider? When it first comes out, yes, it's gummy, but it dries in the... Um, it dries in the air and it, and it hardens. Um, and all right, we are now at the very edge of my knowledge, but some spider silk, some spider web silk is not sticky either. I think the spider can choose if they're gonna, if they're gonna create webbing that is sticky or webbing that is not. But I'm not 100% certain about that. Others. What determines the shape? That's a great question, Doug. What determines the shape of the protein? Um, it, it really is a couple of different things. Some of it is the size of the R groups that sit on, that, sit on that outside of the, of the amino acid. You can imagine really big, bulky side chains are difficult to fit into turns or into tight spaces. So some of it is just the hindrance based on size. But a lot of it are those hydrogen bonds, for example, 
the interaction between the hydrogen on one amino acid and the oxygen on another. Or sometimes, for example, some of your side chains have sulfur in them. And so if I've got an amino acid with sulfur here in the side chain and 100 amino acids later I've got another one, those sulfur molecules actually can form a bridge. It's called a disulfide bond and it creates a link and a bend. So there are a whole set of, of conditions. Some of the side chains don't like water. Some of the side chains are happy with water. So if it's a protein that is in a water and aqueous based solution, all of the side chains that don't like water all kind of fold into the center so there's no water around them. And the side chains that like water are all on the outside. So there's this whole set of rules around what governs the specific shape of the final protein based on that string of amino acids. Great question. Is it the same chemistry and physics of the DNA molecule? Some of the same rules apply. Yes, so the, there are hydrogen bonds that hold the two strands of the DNA together. We'll dig into that in week four. And there are other um, forces that, uh, that keep things apart. So in chemistry, whether we're talking about lipids, proteins, carbs, or nucleic acid, there are some common rules about how certain molecules like and interact and how certain molecules don't. And those rules of chemistry govern across all of those different components. Great question. Yes? Is the silk made because the worm eats the mulberry leaves? I mean, is the mulberry leaves critical to the production of silk? It's a great question. Are the mulberry leaves critical to the production of silk? Um, there are other types of wild silkworms that don't eat mulberry that can still produce silk. Um, but different varieties of silkworm have slightly different strings of amino acids in their silk proteins. And so some wild silkworms, their amino acid strings produce silk that is not as smooth, that does not drape as well. Whether that has to do with the I don't think that has to do with the raw material of the mulberry as much as it does with the DNA instructions that tell the worm, here's how we need to make the silk. Um, apparently, these worms are just happiest on diets of mulberry leaves. Yeah. Not that I'm recommending that we all go out and munch on some mulberry leaves, but yes. Let me see if we have any online questions. Nope. All right. So let's keep on moving. OK, so if you were to look at all the amino acids in silk, you would see if, all the different ones. You would see three amino acids that show up repeatedly over and over and over. Glycine, alanine, and serine. And I've shown them to you here. And you might notice that the R groups, the side chains in yellow, are relatively small. They are not big and bulky. And the other thing that you, would know if you, if you, that you would notice if you looked at the silk amino acids is that you would see a repeating pattern over and over and over. Glycine, serine, glycine, alanine, glycine, alanine. And then a few more amino acids, glycine, serine, glycine, alanine, glycine, alanine. You would see that repeating unit over and over and over and over. And that repeating unit is important to the structure of silk. So let me show you this. So here's a set of amino acids, and I'm just calling these glycine serine, glycine alanine, glycine alanine. This string of amino acids actually assumes a shape that is like if you took a piece of paper and you accordion folded it like you were making a fan. It has that pleated shape to it. And so that's called a beta pleated strand. But then if we kept on looking at the rest of the amino acids out here, so now we've stretched it all the way around. We would actually see, here is my repeat again. Glycine serine, glycine alanine, glycine alanine. And then here we again. Glycine serine, glycine alanine, glycine alanine, and again. And so these pleated sheets form, and then hydrogen bonds link one sheet to the other, one strand to the other. And so we end up with a huge, long accordion fold structure that is found in about 80% of the silk fiber. 
And this structure, this pleated accordion fold shape, is part of what gives silk its characteristic feel and drape and shimmer. This specific pleated sheet structure. So held together by hydrogen bonds. So here's a cross section of a fiber of silk. And you can see it contains two circular strands of fibronin protein. And then it has this, this set of protein all the way around it called serosin. The serosin protein holds the fibronin strands together and gives it that, that, that circular um, one complete strand. If you looked at the fibronin, you would see it was made up of a lot of little tiny fibrils. And those little tiny fibrils have, here's the silk, here are the pleated sheets of the silk. So the pleated sheets form the fibrils, lots of fibrils form the fibron, the fibron and the serosin actually forms the silk fiber. So these pieces build in complexity, one on the other, on the other, on the other. And that's what gives us this fiber, which is extracted by this caterpillar, three thousand hundreds to thousands of yards of it in a single cocoon. And then we wind multiple of those strands together to get a silk thread. And then we can weave those threads together to give us silk fabric. Pleated sheets provide the strength. Those small side chains, glycine, alanine, and serine, give it the smooth feel. And then the irregular, the other 15%, help give it its sparkle, help give it its shine. And those other 15% are what take up the dye. These in the, that form the beta sheets don't take up dye at all. So the dye is taken up by the non-sheet pieces. OK, let's shift gears. Let's talk about another natural fiber. Let's talk about wool. So wool typically comes from sheep. That's right. And wool is different from hair in a number of important ways. Wool is elastic. It stretches. Wool has a crimp to it, so it kind of has a, a wave in it. Wool is insulating in ways that hair is not. Um, and wool is composed of a completely different protein called keratin. And yes, keratin is also found in your nails, and keratin is found in your hair. It has a slightly different structure in your hair and in your nails than it does in the wool of sheep. Here's an image, a drawing of a cross section of a wool fiber. We are not going to dig deep into it, but I want you to see the same kind of pattern. Right here at the end, these really thin, wispy strands, that's the keratin protein. And multiple keratin protein strands are woven together to give us this tiny fibril. And then 11 of these fibers come together to give us a microfibril. And then dozens of those give us a macrofibril. And then this works together around a cortical cell, which then fits within the cortex of the strand of wool. And then there are these cuticles arranged like roof tiles on the outside. So this protein, woven, uh, twisted together, many strands, is part of a larger and larger building piece to give us one strand of wool. Everybody with me on that? It's kind of that, just like we saw with the silk, it's that building, 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 building. Alpha keratin proteins don't form beta pleated sheets, they form helixes. And so here are our amino acids. In gray, they form a helix. That shape again is driven by hydrogen bonds that link one part of the ribbon chain to the next. So a different set of structures, a different approach, but this alpha helix is what gives wool its spring. It's part of what allows it to absorb water, allows it to be elastic. The way that it's packed together um, allows it to hold in heat and to draw in moisture. Again, all because of the structure of the protein. All right, and then different thicknesses of wool give us different bits of inf different uh, different qualities. So those of you that grew up with really coarse, scratchy wool in sweaters and jumpers and things, 
This is what that wool looks like. The merino wool is thinner. The cuticle is much smoother. It produces a finer weave and is much less scratchy. So when you think about wool, it's got great properties. It holds in heat. It absorbs water. You can stretch it, and it will come back to its original shape. Silk does not stretch very well. You've got cashmere, um, which actually comes from the wool, or the alpha keratin from goats. You've got uh, alpaca here. Lots of different kinds, but essentially they've all got the same structure. They just pack into a finer or a coarser weave. And just for comparison, you've got a human hair, which is a whole lot bigger than a strand of wool. But it doesn't have that structure. But it doesn't have the same structure. It doesn't have that um, protofibers into microfibrils, into macrofibrils, into the cortex, and all those other pieces. It has a similar protein, different structure, different shape. Great question. OK, so some of you are wondering how much longer we're going to talk about proteins. Um, this is probably our heaviest chemistry of, of all of our sessions. So, so I totally get that. Let me stop and see if we've got any questions. Ooh, what makes the difference in the high quality silk? So as I understand it, it's a couple of things. Some of it is the specific silkworm uh, varieties that are used. You know, some silkworm varieties produce different types of silk. But a lot of it has to do with the process of how it is, um, how it is spooled, how it is treated, if it is chemically, if, there are any, if there's anything thing chemically done to it, and then how it is woven. Um, so I think so. It, that seems to be a lot of the component around high quality versus low quality. And I should have said, just to put this in context, to make a single silk kimono, it takes 5,000 silkworms. Yeah. Yeah. Gary. How long has the engineering structure of silk and wool been known? Yeah, how long has the engineering structure of silk and wool been known? Um, you know, since, we, since microscopes were invented, you could at least get some of this kind of structure and texture. Uh, the understanding of amino acids as the building blocks of proteins really were in the 40s and 50s. So, and then the ability to decipher an individual protein is really relatively recent. So I would say only within the last two, maybe three decades have we really understood it to the level even beyond what we're talking about here. Because the design on the inside, I've never seen this before, <coughs> looks very similar to what you would find in the Golden Gate Bridge as far as the cabling structures are concerned. Yeah, the design is similar to what you see in a lot of engineering concepts. With multiple strands of steel, for example, wrapping together to provide something that is much stronger than any individual strand. Um, and so I think that those, those laws of nature weigh out. The, the, um, and it turns out that many of the things that we've determined work well in engineering happen to be mimics of what happens in, in, you know, in, the, real, in, in the natural world. Mm. Than just form? Scratchy wool seems to be almost an allergy. Is there more involved than just form? That's a good question. I'm not 100% certain about that. Um, I'm going to ask uh, our moderator in the other room to see if she can find some information and send me some answers. So, yes, White. I have a question about the hair. About hair. Ah, what causes it to be curly if it's not the bonds and the protein? Um, so I think there are some of those same chemical bonds, some of those, um, those hydrogen bonds, for example, that do help it 
that do help it become curly and our genetic our gene, our recipes, as you know, you've taught this to students for, for a while, shape what those amino acids are. Um, I think that the keratin in human hair has a different, it still has those bonds, but I think it is assembled in a different way than the keratin fibers that we find in the wool. Yes, so all of these animals, their wool has different textures. And you actually find different textures of wool in different parts of the same animal's body. So, yeah, so, so there's variation even, from, even within an animal that has the same set of genetic instructions that depending on what part of the body you're looking at, you're gonna see different, different patterns of wool, different coarseness, different thickness, different amounts of lanolin uh, protecting it, uh, providing the water buffer around it. Great point. So I have seen this as well, that silk is the strongest natural fiber and it is stronger than any other at the, at the same thickness, any other man-made uh, steel, you know, any of those pieces. So it is, um, I was gonna say pound for pound or length for length, it is a stronger structure than anything else. Okay, so let's keep moving. So now let's talk about artificial fibers. So silk and wool, are expensive. They are time consuming to produce. And so the search was on to try to find an artificial silk, an artificial version of silk. So I'm going to fast forward, fast forward as 200 years to the 1860s. There's a silkworm disease in France and the country calls Louis Pasteur, who knows nothing about silkworms but knows something about infectious agents, to come to try to figure out what's going on and what's causing the silkworm epidemic, the silkworm disease. And he brings with him a young man who is his assistant, who is the Count de Chardonnay. This is the Count in his later years. And the Count in his younger years with Louis Pasteur is fascinated about silkworms and wants to learn everything about how silkworms do their work, how they, how they eat the mulberry leaves, and then how they form these tiny threads of silk. Decades later, as an adult, the Count is a huge fan of the relatively new art of photography. And he's working with his photographic plates, and there's a solution called nitrocellulose that you actually put on, my pants are sliding down. <laughs> there we go. <clears throat> anyway, um, yeah, I just lost my total train of thought there. Um, <laughs> photography plates. So nitrocellulose, thank you, Julie. Nitrocellulose was used to coat and preserve the photography plates, and he spilled the nitrocellulose. Now, nitrocellulose, cellulose, as we'll talk about next week, is made from plants. It's a plant-based material, so hold that for next week. But let me just say, he spilled it, and he didn't get to clean it up immediately, and by the time he came back to clean it up, it was a sticky mess. And as he was trying to clean it up, he noticed that he was pulling these long threads that reminded him of the silk that had come from the silkworms that he had seen in his youth. And he had always been fascinated with this concept, so he wondered if he could actually create an artificial silk from this nitrocellulose. And so he forced it through what looked like a shower head that had tiny little tubes that formed these really thin filaments and he found that he could spin them together and he could produce thread that he could then turn into fabric. And so this was called Chardonnay silk. And when it was first presented to the public, people went wild for it because the Count de Chardonnay had figured out how to replicate nature. 
He had figured out how to imitate something in nature. It looked like silk. It shone like silk. It was smooth like silk. It was like silk in every way except one really important piece. And that was that it would spontaneously explode. <laughs> which had to do with the nitro in the nitrocellulose. But undeterred, he opened a factory, opened many factories, and made Chardonnay silk and sold it as gowns. And the people that worked in his factory were less than kind and called Chardonnay silk mother-in-law silk. And the joke was, if you don't like your mother-in-law, buy her a nightgown of Chardonnay silk and a match. <laughs> now, my mother-in-law is in the audience. I will not be buying you a Chardonnay silk nightgown. There's a story about a gentleman and his dance partner who was wearing a long Chardonnay silk gown, and he was smoking, and he flicked ash, and her dress ignited in a puff of flame. Um, there's no mention of what actually happened to her, but you can imagine that is not the best way to build a business model. So, Chardonnay silk, yes, had some, you know, was really the first man-made silk, but it did not last at all. So, there were other groups that took cellulose, not nitrocellulose, and figured out how they could actually liquefy, dissolve, force it through these spinnerets, uh, finish it, and create fabric. And so those are fabrics like Selenese fabrics or um, viscose silk. Some of you might remember viscose silk. Viscose because the, the mixture was incredibly thick. It was incredibly viscous. And so in the 20s, 30s, 40s, viscose silk and these artificial silks became incredibly popular. They looked like silk, but they cost a fraction of the price. And now everybody could afford silk. So all of these, viscose, selenese, acetate, wood silk, art silk, art for artificial, the silk industry really pushed back and said, none of these are silk. They should not be called silk. So in the 1920s, the uh, American Dry Goods Association launched a competition to find new names for artificial silk without using the word silk. And proposals included Lustron and Glistra. Lustron and Glistra, because of the shiny nature or the glistening nature of the fabric, but they settled on rayon from the French word for a for, um, for a beam of light because of the luster that came from this. And so in the 30s and 40s, you can see that this is an ad in vogue by DuPont. You're right, so right in rayon. Versatile, viscose rayon. And what they go on to talk about is that this rayon can do everything from silky crepe, dresses, to velvet-like dresses, to taffetas and chiffons, this miracle material can make all sorts of things depending on if you have long fibers or if you cut it short. You can even make wool-like things, not wool, but wool-like things from rayon. So rayon is actually called a semi-synthetic fiber because it's made from wood pulp, so it's not fully artificial, but it is made in a process that you would not find occurring naturally in the world like wool or silk. So rayon also blends well with other fibers. So we've got lots of pieces around the room of rayon, of rayon fabrics, or sometimes they're called, we found several of them that were actually called viscose. Um, or, um, or wood silk, wood, because it comes from, from cellulose. And so that opened the door to fully artificial fabrics. Nylon, polyester, and acrylic. Um, so these are made from petroleum-based products, from petrochemicals. Uh, and 
so these are, these are also polymers. They are repeating units, just like proteins are polymers of amino acids. And they can be manufactured as long filaments. They can be manufactured as big sheets of plastic-like things that you then chip up and melt and spin into long filaments. Nylon was developed in the late 1930s. Polyester in, the in 1941 was trademarked Dacron. And then acrylic in the mid-1940s, and it was also trademarked Orlon. And you see the on theme, rayon, nylon, orcron, uh, Dacron, Orlon, that kind of theme of fabrics. This is the most chemistry heavy slide that I'm gonna show you. And I only put it up here because I want you to see what the repeating units are of each of these molecules. So again, each one of these points has a carbon at it. The nylon, six comma six form of nylon is a really long repeating molecule, repeated thousands and thousands of times. Polyester, this particular version of polyester, has a very different structure, a ring-like structure where there's a carbon, 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 lots of double bonds. We talked about double bonds last week when we talked about unsaturated fats. And then the repeating unit of orlon, of acrylic, is much smaller. There's a carbon, a carbon, and then we've got a triple bond with a nitrogen. So it's a much smaller unit, but again, it's repeated thousands and thousands of times. Nylon, polyester, and acrylic have a number of uses. They are inexpensive to produce. They can be made waterproof in many circumstances. Depending on the way you cut and uh, shape them, they can feel like silk, they can feel like wool, they can feel like cotton, they blend. So you've got lots of things, including leisure suits. <laughs> Some of you in this room were alive during the polyester leisure, shoot, leisure, leisure suit craze of the 1970s. Some of you still have some. <laughs> but lots of artificial fabrics. And I'm willing to bet if you walk into your closet, especially if you look at the high-tech fabrics, these are blends of these artificial fabrics. They might be blended with cotton or blended with wool or blended with silk, but they are likely blends. Huge options, huge opportunities, but also a whole lot of challenges. And so let's talk about the challenges that come with these synthetic fibers. Again, they're made from raw materials from petroleum-based products. So they're made from um, resources, fossil fuel resources that have a limited, we have a limited amount of them. There are incredibly harsh chemicals that are used to string these polymers together, to finish them, to purify them, and then to get them to a usable form to be used in fabrics. So incredibly harsh chemicals that are not necessarily environmentally friendly. And then this is something that really only in the last four or five years have we really started being aware of, and this is the concept of microfibers. So every material, every fabric sheds tiny fibers out of the fabric. Linen, cotton, silk, they shed. The artificial fabrics shed enormous amounts of microfibers. So this is a study that was done in 2016, a laundry load of six kilograms, which is about 13 pounds of laundry. When it was washed under typical conditions, this is what they found, that polyester cotton blends shed about 137, 138,000 microfibers. Polyester alone shed almost half a million fibers, and the acrylics shed nearly three quarters of a million microfibers from 13 pounds of laundry. These microfibers are not caught by our water filtration systems. So they go through the, you know, the washing machine water outgo, it goes to the water treatment plant, it passes right through the water treatment plant, it goes into the water sources, and it is eaten by fish and other small animals. So these are plastics nylon, polyester, acrylic, these are at heart plastics. And these don't, these are not biodegradable. So these microfibers end up in the environment, they end up in animals, which ultimately passes them up the food chain. 
So this is a huge issue that we have to think about how we address this. And maybe that means that we think about ways to create these fibers that minimize shedding. Maybe we think about better, better ways to filter out the microfibrils. Maybe we think about other fabrics that we purchase instead. We love these synthetic fabrics. They drape, they do so many different things, they repel moisture, they keep us, um, they wick moisture away so they keep us cool or they keep us warm. They're inexpensive, but they come at a pretty high cost. Now, I could make the same argument that wool comes, from a, comes with a high cost because we have to maintain sheep and sheep are grazers and sheep take up a lot of land that could be used for other things and there are a lot of people that are really unhappy with the way wool is harvested and the way sheep are sheared so i could make these kinds of arguments and challenges about lots of different fibers remember biotech 201 is a judgment-free zone <laughs> remember i am not here to tell you you should buy this or you shouldn't buy this but I honestly was completely unaware of many of these challenges. I didn't know anything about the microfiber issue until I started doing this. And I was stunned to discover how much of our clothing, how much of the stuff that's in my closet sheds bits of plastic into the water supply. And again, they're not biodegradable and the dyes that are used, and this is necessarily true all the way around, unless you're using historical dyes, most of these dyes are not environmentally friendly. They're harsh, whether we're talking about synthetics or we're talking about other natural fibers. Okay, so key take-home points. We talked a lot about protein tonight. Maybe the most entertaining part of tonight was not the protein it was seeing me in a hose and a wig. <laughs> I will do whatever I need to do to actually have your eyes up here as I talk about chemistry. I totally get that. Key take home points. We spend a lot of time talking about proteins. Proteins are one of our biomolecules of life. They are integral. They are instrumental in the functioning of our cells. We could not be ourselves. Our cells would not function without the role of proteins. And there are so many diverse proteins we won't, but we could spend days talking about the beauty of proteins in your body, the beauty of hemoglobin that carries oxygen, or of insulin that helps signal your body when sugar is present and helps control your sugar levels. All of these protein, collagen that gives you structure to your, to your bones and to parts of your body, all of these proteins are beautifully physically, structurally put together because of the amino acids that make up that chain of protein and then the way that they interact. The hydrogen bonds, the bonds with the outside of the, of the molecules, the, the amino and um, acidic group, the bonds with the side chains. It's just elegant, so incredibly elegant. And as you can imagine, and if you've been to any of these courses before and you've heard us talk about genetic disease, and genetic mutation, spoiler alert for week four, all the instructions for the order of the amino acids are contained in your genes, in your DNA. So when you change the order of the DNA, when you have a genetic mutation and you change the positioning of an amino acid, you substitute one for another or you delete it or you insert something else, you disrupt or you have the potential to disrupt the way it folds and now it can't carry out its function. So structure is so key to the functioning of our proteins. And we specifically talked about, uh, about beta pleated sheets, which give silk its smooth feel and its shine. And we talked about alpha helices, which gives the structure in the spring to keratin inside wool fibers. Man-made fabrics are also polymers. They're not made of amino acids. They don't occur in nature, but they follow the same kind of repeating structure that you put multiple hundreds or thousands of them together and you get a molecule of fiber that's got a set of properties. And the incredible thing about man-made fibers is their flexibility, that you can make them mimic so many other fibers. But again, they come with challenges. 
I think one of the best pieces of advice that I read this week is to buy high quality clothes that you will wear a long time instead of lots and lots of inexpensive clothes that you will discard over and over and over. I'm a little embarrassed when I think about what I know is in my closet and the number of clothes that are in my closet, but that concept of buying high quality clothes and being aware of what it takes to make the fibers that are in your clothes, it's just, it's just being aware of, of the world around us. Okay, so next week, we're gonna talk about carbohydrates. And next week, there is another taste testing. So those of you that are watching from home, you've got a set of instructions of the types of sugars and sugar substitutes that you want to have ready. We'll have all the information for you here. We're going to talk about sugars and where sugars come from. And then we're going to talk about another type of sugar that isn't energy, but it is storage and structural material. So cane sugar, beet sugar, and we're also going to talk about cotton. These two guys, both Richards, are going to be a little bit integral to some of our story, which also gives you a little bit of insight into what you might see me in <laughs> next week. So with that, thank you for being here. Thank you for spending time learning about chemistry. Be safe driving home, and I will see you next week. Have a good night, everybody.